Hey everyone, welcome to Midland Alliance Church's Sunday service. It's great to be with you today. Uh, if you're with us for the first time, joining in online for the first time, I just wanna wish you a special welcome. Uh, my name is Rebecca and uh, at Mac, we just love guests. So something we do every week is we like to send our guests a gift and we also like to pledge a donation to a local charity on your behalf, just uh, to celebrate you being with us. So all you have to do is go to our website, machurch.ca, click on I'm new, and you can fill out a contact card and then we'll be able to send you a free gift and also send you a list of charities to choose from. So before we continue in our service, I just want to let you know about a few things happening in the life of your church. I uh, want to remind you that there is a Thursday morning Bible study led by Felicia Buckle that is still uh, up and running and open to anyone who would like to participate. So if you're looking for uh, a space to study and also to get connected, uh, you can join that group on Zoom. Uh, Thursdays at 10 and you can find out more information and the Zoom link uh, by clicking on the Life Groups page on the website. This week is our uh, Family Feud game night. This is Thursday at 6.30. It's open to everyone. So if you're interested in joining in on that, uh, in that fun evening that's happening this week, you can sign up on the website. Um, there's going to be a pizza dinner provided where you can pick up that in advance so we're going to be able to eat together play some games and we're even going to have a guest uh, host it's going to be a steve harvey impersonator so it's going to be pretty fun so please sign up if you are interested in joining in i uh, want to remind you also about our prayer team at mac we uh, have a team that's ready and waiting to pray for any requests that you put forward. So if you or someone that you know uh, needs prayer, please uh, submit a request. You can do that in a couple of different ways. You can click prayer on the website, or you can also send an email to prayer at machurch.ca. Uh, lastly, tithes and offerings can be given in several different ways. Uh, you can send an e-transfer to office at machurch.ca. You can click give on the website and you can give using the Tithely app that way. Or you can mail or drop off your envelopes and the office hours are Tuesday to Thursdays from 9 to 1 um, or by appointment. So that's it for me. Um, enjoy the rest of your service and look forward to seeing you soon. can I give to you? What can I offer to the King for all the love you've shown, for all your mercy over me? I called your name, you heard my cry. Out of the grave and into life, my heart is yours, my soul is free. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. You suffer 
has been on the fritz lately, so I've gone to fix it. I might need your help, so I'll call you on the kids ministry's phone. Please answer it. Please, 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 pretty please. With sugar on top. I'm afraid this could turn out bad. From Isaac. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome to Kids Moment. My name is Isaac. And I'm Noah. Isaac, I am so sorry. I tried to answer the phone, but it's broken. There's no talk button and it just keeps ringing. Talk button? Noah, this is an old tiny phone. It doesn't have a talk button. Uh, you have to pick up the receiver and talk into it like this. Hello, McFly. I don't know what to say. I didn't grow up with a phone like this. You know what? It's my fault. I shouldn't have trusted you with something like this. You are too young. Actually, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. That's not true. You're actually older than you look. Thank you? And if they're taught well, young people can do some pretty big things. You know what? That's true. In fact, that's what today's Bible story is all about. In the book of Acts, Paul and Silas were traveling all over, telling people the good news of Jesus. And while they were traveling, they met this young guy named Timothy. Hmm, I wonder if he knew how to answer the phone. Probably not, but he still definitely knew how to follow Jesus. You see, all of the Christians knew Timothy, and they said great things about him. In fact, Paul was so impressed with some in y with young Timothy, he invited to come with them and help him grow the early church. So what happened? I mean, was it a good choice? Or did Timothy totally buff it? You know, I think we should find out for ourselves. In just a second, press pause on the video and then open your Bible and read the verses on the screen. When you're finished, we'll see you back here. Acts 16, 1 to 4. Isn't that awesome? Even though Timothy was young, he didn't buff it. He crushed it. He was a huge help to Paul and Silas, and because of that, the Bible says the churches were made strong in the faith. The number of believers grew every day. Acts 16, 15. It's so true. A lot of times people tell kids, you're too young for that. And sometimes they're right. Kids are too young to drive a car or vote for the prime minister, but that doesn't mean kids can't do important things. That's why Paul and Pipe invited Timothy to be a part of his team. Even though Timothy was young, Paul knew that God could do big things through him. You're right. In fact, later on, Paul wrote a couple of letters to Timothy. A letter is a kind of email on paper. Thanks. I know what a letter is. Just checking. Paul's letters to Timothy are now books in the Bible. The books are called 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. In the book of 1 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy about the five ways that he could be an example to other believers. Hey, you know what? 
That gives me an idea for a fun challenge. Let's reveal the five ways of the pie eating contest. Here's how it's going to work. There are pictures on the bottom of each of these pies. We have to eat the pie face first until we can see what the picture is. When, when we can tell what it is, we'll call out it out. The person who reveals the most pictures wins. Are you kidding me? I just finished wiping pie off my face from earlier. You can never have too much pie. Let's do it. Three, two, one, go! But seriously, so fun. Seriously, so much fun. But remember, we did that for a reason. All of these pictures on the bottom of the pies tell us about ways ways of the book of First Timothy says. Young people can be a good example to other to other believers. Look at this. You can be an example through your speech. Let words be appropriate, truthful, and kind. That's right. Uh, you can also be an example through your conduct. Let your actions and what you do with your hands show that you love and follow Jesus. You can also be an example through way of love. Show love to everyone, even people who are hard to love. Uh, you, can be, you can be an example through your faith. Read your Bible and spend time praying to God every day. And lastly, you can be an example through your purity. Stop sinning before it happens. Say no when that devil tempts you to do the wrong thing. Isn't that so cool? You might have to wait to drive a car, but you don't have to wait a single minute to do something big for God. You can be a good example to other believers right now. That's what our Bible verse for today says. Let's take a look at that together. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech. In speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. 1 Timothy 4.12 I love that verse. And you know what? It makes me think of a question. What can you do to set a good example for other Christians? Even though you're young, God has a big job for you. Right, and the job doesn't start when you get older. It doesn't start even tomorrow. It starts right now. So young people, go out there and show everyone what it looks like to be a follower of Jesus. And you know what, Noah? I'll even teach you how to use this phone. Oh good, because I was wondering how to get to the apps. What? Peace is a mile. 
comes my way, I will trust you. Well, hey there, folks. Welcome to our online service. Hope you're having a great day, and it's great to connect with you. And want to thank Rebecca for sharing with us uh, last Sunday on Mother's Day. Did a great uh, message. Encourage you to go and check that out if you haven't already. And now we're continuing our series called Power and Influence, where we're looking at the first kings of Israel. Saul and David. What 
leadership lessons can we uh, get from looking at their lives and their experience? Last time was called Not My Call. And just summarizing the points from that message, the first one is that godly leaders don't force change, rather they inspire it. They lead in such a way that people want to follow them rather than being forced to follow them. And there was just something about David that resonated with people so much so that they wanted to get behind him. They wanted to go where he was going. And if you've had a leader like that, maybe a teacher or a supervisor or a coach along the way, uh, you know how you've been blessed because of their influence. The so question that we have is, where do I need to be bold yet peaceful? Secondly, godly leaders honor authority and look to God in the process. They know that they don't have the final word. The outcome is not for them, them to determine because that is always the domain of God. We live in a time where authority is being questioned more than ever, and oftentimes that is fair, but even when broken authorities are out of line, godly leaders still honor them as those God has put in place. Godly leaders still look to God to remove someone at the right time or to install someone new at the right time. So with which authority do I need to practice this principle? So we've been living through this pandemic time. Of course, it's affected uh, everything, including sports. And I love sports. Uh, many of you love sports. And I know a lot of you love uh, these guys, your Toronto Maple Leafs. And the NHL has had their season affected, uh, reduced to 56 games this year. Usually it's 82. Same in the NBA, usually an 82-game regular season, reduced this year to 72 games. So the idea of the season being altered, adjusted, shortened. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, a time and a season. How does God use seasons in our lives? What, how does that relate to leadership, and what should our response be? So picking up from where we uh, left off last week, you recall that Saul continues to hunt David, and eventually Saul dies in a battle with the Philistines, along with three of his sons, including Jonathan, who uh, had a very close friendship with David. And upon learning of their deaths, David mourns, and he pens a funeral song. And I want to show you a few verses from this song. 2 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 23. How beloved and gracious were Saul and Jonathan, they were together in life and in death. They were swifter than eagles, stronger than lions. O oh, women of Israel, weep for Saul, for he dressed you in luxurious scarlet clothing and garments decorated with gold. Weep for Saul, David says, despite all the pain and anguish that Saul has put him through, despite all the injustice, the out-and-out -out evil, David is still able to express genuine mourning for his fallen king, leading and commanding his people to follow suit. While Saul lived, many would have got behind David if, if he decided to overthrow the deranged king. And we've seen that in this series, his men in the cave saying, this is your chance to take down the wicked king. But as we've seen in this, seri this series, David refused to dishonor the authority that God had established. David would not kill Saul and take the throne because he understood that Saul was God's man for that time. Saul was God's leader for that season. And this is the first point. God works through seasons. Ecclesiastes says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And then it goes on to list uh, birth, death, building, laughter, giving up, mending, making peace. And the truth is, 
Our lives function across a period of time, don't they? And despite all the efforts of the sci-fi movies to bend time and travel through time, you know, that recent uh, Avengers, uh, latest Avengers movie, of course, had time travel. It works out well for them because they can go back and change uh, key plot developments from former movies. So it works out great. But we know that just does not work in real life. Time is what? It's linear. It's moving from back to front. It's moving forward. You can't go back and change something in the past. Once this moment has passed, that's it. It is history. It is in the past. And the scriptures reveal to us how, how God has worked throughout time as it moves forward, unfolding the story of redemption through many different seasons, through creation when God made the heavens and the earth, through the fall when Adam and Eve gave in to temptation, through judgment when God uh, judged the planet and destroyed uh, everyone except for Noah and his family. And then, of course, on the tail end of that, the new birth through the remnant of Noah's family and rebuilding. And then through, through the season of calling as God reached out to a man, Abram, and said, go to a place that I will show you and I'll make you a great nation. Through slavery as Israel was taken into captivity and made to be slaves in Egypt for some 400 years. Through the season of deliverance through the prophet uh, Moses and the Exodus, through the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, through prophecy, the major and minor prophets that we see in the scriptures, through, of course, the Messiah, the one who came from heaven to earth to be the mediator between God and man, through salvation, this great gift that we receive by, by grace through faith, through sonship, as you and I are brought in to become uh, the children of God through Jesus Christ, through the church, this great uh, living organism that is uh, brothers and sisters from all corners of the earth coming together under the lordship and leadership of Jesus Christ, through the restoration as God will restore all things in the end, through judgment as he will uh, judge all before the uh, at the great white throne and ultimately the season of eternity that lasts forever god has always worked through seasons it's true not just on this grand large scale as i just laid out to you sort of the biblical narrative but also for our individual lives as well now some seasons are more tumultuous than others. And we talked about that earlier in this series, looking at uh, a season of calm or a season of fire, like a storm. But regardless of how exciting or how dull our season might be, we, like David, need to have an awareness that God is working in and through our season. And that allows us to be open to his will and his ways during that time. That's the posture we want to have, right? One that is open and seeing and receiving uh, God's leadership in and through that season, regardless of, you know, uh, how exciting or dull it might be. Let's get back to our story here. Now we're following the death of Saul, and David is finally crowned king, king of Judah at age 30, and after about seven years, he's made king over all of Israel, and he shifts his capital from Hebron to Jerusalem. So let's pick it up, 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 9. So David made the fortress his home, and he called it the city of David. He extended the city, starting at the supporting terraces and working inward. And David became more and more powerful because the Lord God of heaven's armies was with him. 
Then King Hiram of Tyre sent messengers to David along with cedar timber and carpenters and stone masons, and they built David a palace. And David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had blessed his kingdom, watch this, for the sake of his people Israel. So the Lord had confirmed him. David finally comes into his rightful place as king over Israel and remember, this had been prophesied many, many years ago. It's likely been at least 20 years or more since Samuel anointed him when he was a young man, signaling him to be the next king of Israel. Now, that's a long time, isn't it? 20 years. Think about that. I mean, we've been in this pandemic thing for a little over a year, and it's been like, man, way too long. But how about 20 years? You were anointed to be the next rightful king of Israel, and now it's been 20 years. But still, it finally comes to pass here, and David realizes God has done this. God has made this change. God has brought me into this new season. David knew it all along. It wasn't for him to uh, make the change in the seasons. Even though he had all the reason in the world to take the throne and most of the people would have supported that move, but he knew that was not, that was not God's move at that time. Not only did David understand that God had orchestrated this change of seasons now at this time, he realized that it wasn't even about him. Because look, what does he say there? Uh, he realized that God has blessed his kingdom for the sake of his people, Israel. So David knew that perhaps because of all of the trial by fire that he had been through, this role, this opportunity, this kingship, well, it's, it's not about me at all is it? It's about God. It's about his, his people, his agenda, his will. And it's this attitude that God was looking for from the start that's such a beautiful thing. It's this attitude that caused Samuel to identify David as a man after God's own heart. And it's this attitude that Led David, or led David to allow God to lead in his situation rather than taking charge of the circumstance himself. So this is the point. Don't cut your season short. And let's be honest, a lot of the time, we'd like to cut it short because the current season is painful, it's boring, it's unfulfilling, it's limiting, it's uh, challenging, maybe too challenging. It is agonizing. I mean, you, you can use your uh, adjective to describe the season, maybe the season you're in. Maybe our current season is even marked by injustice, how David's previous season was for so long, so many wrongs done to him by wicked King Saul. But the problem is when we take matters into our own hands and we try to force the tides to change, uh, we try to force a new season to come in, we are actually overstepping our, uh, our boundaries. We're overstepping. We're taking a level of authority that we're not supposed to. We're not designed to take. And when we do that, when we try to orchestrate a change of seasons, uh, we may well be giving into a spirit of control, manipulation, or even out-and-out -out rebellion. And that is not good. Gene Edwards, uh, in his book, A Tale of Three Kings, says, In the spiritual realm, realm, those who lead rebellions have already proven, no matter how grandiose their words or angelic their ways, they have a critical nature, an unprincipled character, and hidden motives in their hearts. Frankly, they are thieves. Strong words, but there's something that rings true about that, those words, isn't there? And I have seen, and no doubt you have seen as well, people 
over the years and in different seasons struggling uh, to remain faithful, struggling to uh, persevere because they see it, it, it hurts too much or they feel like it's wrong or it's out of order or they don't trust authority or they have many different reasons to say, you know what, I'm ending this season. I'm going to cut this season uh, short. And it's unfortunate because they may well, in the process, miss out on some of some of the work God wanted to do in their hearts, in their lives. Because remember our first point, God works through seasons. And some of those seasons are, they're just tough. They're just difficult. But don't cut it short just because it's hard. Don't throw in the towel just because it's difficult. God always calls us to persevere, to, to be faithful until uh, the end of that season, and he is the one who orchestrates the transition, not us. Now as king, David, uh, he went on to achieve some incredible accomplishments. He defeated uh, the Philistines in battle. He brought the Ark of the Covenant uh, into Jerusalem. He had scores of military victories, but of course, as you know, as we've mentioned in this series, he had some significant missteps as well. He took a married woman, Bathsheba, and slept with her just because he saw her and he wanted her, and he gave in to that temptation. And if that, as if that wasn't enough, he then sent her husband, Uriah, to the front lines of battle, which would all but guarantee his death. And that's exactly what happens. Uriah is killed just as David had planned. So he essentially commits not just adultery, but murder as well. And God's judgment comes down hard on the king through the prophet Nathan in a beautiful uh, delivery uh, of, of prophecy against the king. Uh, God tell, tells David, I will cause your own household to rebel against you in 2 Samuel chapter 12. So this would be, these words would be fulfilled through David's third son, Absalom. And Absalom was tall and handsome and influential and also power hungry. And he is banished for a time after killing his half-brother Amnon for the rape of his sister Tamar but he is eventually reunited with his father, uh, David. But Absalom's selfish ambition gets the better of him, and he actually begins to organize a revolt against his father, the king. Let's look at chapter 15 of 2 Samuel. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say, Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. So there you see it. Absalom's movement is gaining momentum. And David decides to flee the capital, actually, with a small group of faithful followers, essentially to avoid the trouble here uh, with his son Absalom. Let's go to chapter 16 now. As King David came to Bahurim, a man came out of the village cursing them. It was Shimei, son of Gera, from the same clan as Saul's family. He threw stones at the king and the king's officers and all the mighty warriors who surrounded him. Get out of here, you murderer, you scoundrel, he shouted at David. The Lord is paying you back for all the bloodshed in Saul's clan. You stole his throne, and now the Lord has given it to your son Absalom. At last you will taste some of your own medicine, for you are a murderer. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Abishai, son of Zariah, demanded. Let me go over and cut off his head. No, the king said. Who asked your opinion, you sons of Zariah? If the Lord has told him to curse me, who are you to stop him? Then David said to Abishai and to all of his servants, My own son is trying to kill me. Doesn't this relative of Saul have even more reason to do so? Leave him alone and let him curse. 
for the Lord has told him to do it. And perhaps the Lord will see that I am being wronged and will bless me because of these curses today. Wow. Let him curse, the king says, despite being ousted from his own palace by his own son Absalom's rebellion. David continues to trust in God, understanding that God is still the one who is control, and he is the one who's orchestrating these events, even down to this uh, villager pronouncing curses upon his head. I mean, think of it. David is the king of Israel who can snap his fingers and say, kill that person, kill that person for whatever reason on a whim. And here you have this villager cursing him, but David sees uh, God in and through even this circumstance. David knows if this is to be the end of his kingship, so be it. If his son Absalom was to usurp the throne, so be it. But on the other hand, if God were to see his heart, if God were to see that he was trying to do right by him, he was trying to walk in integrity even in this season, perhaps he would work things out in his favor. And that is fine too. David's story beautifully illustrates our last point I want to share with you today, and that is this. Don't overextend your season. David's life models submission in such a beautiful way. He He didn't mind being dethroned, you see. He didn't force his way into becoming the king, and he wouldn't force its preservation either. He wouldn't hang on to the arms of that throne no matter what the way Saul did. Imagining David's thoughts and dialogue during this critical time, Edwards writes, I judge my own heart first and rule against its interests. I will do what I did under Saul. I will leave the destiny of the kingdom in God's hands alone. Isn't that beautiful? Because we know, as the scriptures tell us, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's so easy for our hearts to be uh, consumed with control and selfish ambition and pride. But David would not go there. I'll leave the destiny of the kingdom in God's hands alone. David would... uh, He would not remain king longer than God would have him to be king. He would not hang on to the throne. He would not cling to power. Instead, he would trust in God. And it turned out that this would not be the end of David's season because Absalom, uh, who is working up this coup against uh, David to take the throne, he, he was actually killed in battle sometime later. David would remain king for over 10 more years, in fact, before passing on the mantle to his son Solomon, just before he would die. So David reigned as king for 40 years. And it was really his heart, you see, that made him such a great candidate to serve for such a long season because David had a heart after God. And God's called all of us, all each one of us, you and I, to have a similar heart, an attitude that is marked by submission, a refusal to grab for power or hang on to, to power, prolonging a season that really needs to come to an end, a desire to obey God, nothing more and nothing less. This is the calling, to be faithful to him uh, in the middle of that season, and then when he is orchestrating for a change, to be fine with that, to be faithful through that change as well, rather than overextending our time and our season, whether it be in a leadership position, uh, an employment capacity, 
uh, whatever the case might be, and just being open to God's leadership and God's transitions in all of that. So just recapping here, our first point was that God works through seasons. Am I trusting God with the season that I'm in? What season are you in? Uh, A certain professional season where you're in a role or you're in an industry, and are you trusting God with that? You know, are you continuing to look to God's leadership even in and through uh, business and career and work? Am I trusting God? Or uh, developmental season, am I looking to him as I'm taking steps to uh, grow, to develop in my spiritual uh, life? And am I in a season of growth and development? Or even in my uh, you know, economic, uh, financial growth and development? Or physical growth and development and health? Am I trusting God with the season that I'm finding myself in, even as it relates to uh, relationships? Am I looking to God, trusting him in the middle of this? Secondly, don't cut your season short. Don't cut your season short. And we pray, God, help me to be faithful in this season because he always calls us to faithfulness. He wants us to do his will, even when it's hard. Of course, we take our example from the Lord Jesus himself who prayed and said, not my will, but your will be done. Help me to do what you've called me to do, even in this season, even if it's really a challenging one. And finally, don't overextend your season. Don't uh, push it beyond uh, the time it's supposed to go. Don't uh, you know, hang on longer than you should if God is actually moving you for a change. And so we pray, God, move me according to your will because he is the one who is sovereign. He is the one who is uh, moving the chess pieces. He is the one who is in control. So we just want to be willing and open to that submissive to him the master craftsman. Amen. Let's take a minute and pray together. Our Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to look, uh, continue to look at these kings, Saul and David, and Lord, to see how you worked um, in and through them and the lessons we can uh, take from them. And Lord, we thank you for David, for his heart that was for you, that allowed him to be sensitive to uh, how you are working, how you are moving pieces in and through the different seasons that he experienced. And Lord, we know you work through seasons. As the scripture said, there's a time and a season for everything. And ultimately, Lord, you are in charge. God, help my brother, help my sister hearing these words to trust you with the season they find themselves in, whether it's related to a a job, a career, profession, uh, relationship, season, uh, some kind of development for them personally or interpersonally. God, uh, bless them. Help help us to have an awareness of your uh, work, God, that you are in control. We trust you and look to you. God, help us not to cut our season short. Uh, God, to work to change or overturn the season because that's not for us to do, but Lord, rather help us to be faithful. As you are faithful to us, may we be faithful to what you've called us to do even in this season, whether it's sort of flat and dull or whether it's tumultuous and challenging. God, we want to be faithful to do what you've called us to do. And at the same time, Lord, help us to be sensitive to when you say, Now I'm moving the pieces, God, to when you are uh, making a change. God, we don't want to overextend our time, overextend our season beyond what you've called us to. So, Lord, give us that sensitivity that we will go and move with your will. Let thy will be done, not ours. We give you thanks for your great love for us, Lord, for your faithfulness to us, and God, that you are sovereign over all in our lives personally and over uh, over the world. God, everything is yours, and we trust you as we continue in this challenging 
season we've been in for over a year now. God, we thank you for positive developments. We continue to pray that you'll give wisdom to folks making decisions. God, that there can be a better report coming sooner rather than later. And we give you thanks, God, because you cause all things to work together for the good of those who love you. So we love you, Lord. We trust in you. Bless my brother. Bless my sister and their families. For this time together, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. We want to pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Remember, our Family Feud event is coming up uh, this Thursday. We'd love to see you and connect with you there. Uh, there's going to be a guest host, and uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Anyways, hope to see you there. You can still sign up if you haven't done so already. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together as we close our service. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, God bless folks so much. Have a great day.